we're going to ask to talk a little bit about uh, my geography and uh, I put the CV here and uh, what I can say right now I'm a senior physicist at Brookhaven National Lab in the uh, United States, uh, specifically in New York and uh, I believe people can go through the CV but I'm, I'm sure that people, that most of the students, they will ask him who is this guy? Who is this physicist? How he became into the United States and how he became a physicist? Let me give you a quick highlight how I end up here as a, a Brookhaven, very nice lab, excellent lab for research. Uh, my name is Rashid Musa. I, am, I was born in France, specifically Milhouse, uh, east of France, close to Genoa, close to the border of Germany. And my mother, she's French, and my father is from Algeria. And uh, after that, I moved to when I moved to Algeria, specifically uh, close to the east side, uh, not far from Constantin, for the people who know the, the, the town. And uh, there, and I, I moved with my father there, and uh, I grew up with my. Uh, in Algeria and I went to very good uh, high school. I was very lucky and uh, at high school I was very strong in mathematics and the science and after that when I get my bachelor degree I moved to University of Constantine. It's one of the best I can say best university one of the best universities in, uh, in, uh, in Algeria. And there, very quickly, I was very lucky. There was very good, a uh, lot of good professors at university, at that university, and they learned very good physics, uh, exact science, and they did uh, solid state, uh, theoretical physics, physics energetic in French language, and uh, nuclear physics. And really, I end up among the top of the, the class. And uh, it was very good, very good motivating uh, environment at this at that university, Constantine. And uh, at the end of what you call the BSS, Diploma Institute Superior, after four years after the bachelor degree, I get the scholarship from Algeria. But when I went uh, to go to France, when I went to the embassy, I found that that I have also the French uh, scholarship. I end up with two. And my choice is why I don't st I step down from the Algerian scholarship and my friend number position number next after me for the position he gets it and we end up and I took the French one we end up four people going to France to to University of Claude Bernard in Lyon and from that that at that time mostly we found out that, that ourselves that we are just repeating the program that we learn at University of Wisconsin this uh, this minute teacher there, they were very good and it was very, very, very easy for us to, to make a diploma to the uh, approfondi in uh, at university. And very quickly I found that, that I have to move to Strasbourg because they, they, would want to, uh, they do the experimental physics. And I moved from Lyon to Strasbourg and, uh, at that time and uh, I did my PhD in nuclear structure. And I built the silicon detectors with a very good uh, uh, scientists at uh, Centre National de Recherche Scientifique in Strasbourg and also uh, University of Pasteur. And when I finished my PhD, it was uh, with the prison with felicitation. After that, I looked for a postdoc. And I sent my application mostly in different locations and I was accepted and I made choice when I end up I went to Argonne National Lab in Chicago at University and also University of Illinois Chicago. And that at that time started to get the new English detector heavy ions and doing physics at Argonne. And now when we finish, we bring the detector to Brookhaven National Lab. And I was uh, associate research professor at University of Illinois Chicago. And very quickly, when I came to Brookhaven, I was offered the job to be directly associate physicist 
And it was a very exciting moment because I spent uh, 1997 in Canada to the uh, United States and after two or three years, associate physicist uh, at Brookhaven and very quickly we built a detector which was very successful, we did a physics analysis and uh, uh, from there we went, uh, I moved to from associate physicist to physicist and after now many years I became a similar physicist and we are doing very exciting physics, EBI, relativity heavy ion and uh, It's an amazing laboratory, yeah. And we are moving now from the relativist EV ion collider to something electron ion collider, which is new process in the future. And I have a chance to meet my colleague at Aviat Brookhaven. And uh, it's a very stimulant place for the research and doing physics. I think I hope I didn't forget too many things. And uh, if anybody has questions from the students, please go ahead. I think this is all we. Uh, any question? I mean, don't hesitate to jump and ask questions. Huh? Go ahead, please. Anyone has question before I move to lectures? Okay. Uh, looks like David is no questions. We move to. The lectures, or we wait. Yes, for let's uh, then let's move to the lectures, um, and uh, people may ask you questions along the okay. way, or they may contact okay. you directly. Good. Yeah, so yes, no problem, no problem. I can share all the expertise that they have uh, during my life and how it became physicists. Okay, let me share. I can go to the lectures and. Uh, You see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Once again, I mean, very happy to participate in the conference, and uh, and I see, I mean, this is a uh, very exciting African school for fundamental physics and application. I see there is two parts of this conference. There is a fundamental physics, and also there is application. This means can talk about detectors technology and accelerator. I divide the, talk, the lectures in two parts. There is a third lecture one, which is mostly about physics. We talk about introduction to relativistic heavy and physics and detector technology. The second part is mostly about the discovery of quark gluon plasma report GP. We talk about the signature. And also we talk about the future projects and opportunities. And I think the second part is really, uh, uh, we'll see how much uh, we discovered that part. Let's start with the first part. Introduction to relativity by uh, physics and detector technology. And uh, as you see here, this is my picture and this is a silicon detector in my hand that we use for experiments for both which is finished in 2005. Here, before I start to talk about the topic, I give you some highlights, and I would like you to take a look about this animation that we have at Brookhaven National Lab, and uh, what we are going to talk about, and what. And I think this video will give you some highlights about mostly the topic of physics, the relativity of the ion, and also the uh, motivation for this. Let's hope it's going to start in this. Yeah. Relativistic heavy ion collider with Brookhaven National Laboratory. Gold ions collide at nearly the speed of light, recreating on a subatomic scale the conditions in the universe. The protons and neutrons in the colliding ions are each made of three quarks, held together by force carrier particles called gluons. When the ions collide, the energy of the collision melts the protons and the neutrons into their component quarks and gluons and creates thousands of new particles. In offset collisions, Rick scientists have observed a dramatic asymmetry in the expansion of these particles, with more emerging along the reaction plane than the particular two. They had expected to find a gas with little or no interaction among quarks 
and more uniform expansion. Instead, the asymmetric expansion and strong interactions have led Rick researchers to conclude that the Earth universe was a new, nearly perfect liquid. The asymmetry and strong interactions of this new state of liquid matter can be seen again in this side by side view. I mean, as you saw in this animation, mostly we are going to talk about quark loop. And we are talking about mostly the collision of Higley I mean, you see here in the left side, this is the structure of matter. Huh? And it's composed from electrons, and you have inside there the nucleus. The nucleus is made from protons and neutrons. And we found out also that we learned that these protons and neutrons are made. The particle participating in the strong V interaction, and which is holding the spark inside, the protons and neutrons and pions, we mostly call them hadrons. Okay? We know that since 30 years that the protons and neutrons are not elementary particles, but they have also quarks inside. And these quarks are, uh, we call them, are mostly elementary fermions with a fraction of if you see here on the, uh, on the side, you see this is mostly the quarks that we have inside the, what you call the nuclear. Okay, you can be charm, bottom, also pop and uh, up and down. And we have the left ones in here. This means these quarks are holding in, inside these nucleons or the protons and neutrons, yeah? or the part, uh, other particles like ions by the strongly and -touch. This is the only thing that's holding them together inside the heart of us. This means in the future when you see me talking about hadrons, I'm talking about neutron protons, ions, or mostly, which I will show in the next slide, is baryons and mesons, which is this other particles. It's not just these two particles. Let's talk about the strongly interaction, which is holding the quarks inside uh, the hadrons. The quantum chromodynamic UCD is the theory which is really describing this strong interaction. What is this quantum chromodynamic? The quantum chromodynamic is a, is a component of the strong model. It's not something new. It's part of the strong model of the universe, of the field. We said also that the quarks, which is, are inside the hadron, carry a strong interaction charge. This means they interact with each other. You see them here. Let me briefly say this. Uh, this is the baryons and this is the mesons. The baryons have three quarks and the mesons, they have three uh, two quarks. Inside. This means the quarks are, have uh, interactive charge and the quarks come from three types. This charge will be called the red, green, and the blue. And the antiquarks, okay, because there is a quark and there is antiquarks. And the antiquarks has antiquark, okay? Quarks. Interact among themselves, yet they change of the Holoc field quanta. Which is, this is a very important point. How the quarks inside the hadrons are connected to each other, interacting with each other. They are interacting by exchanging gluons, which you see them here in this picture here, which is like a uh, smear here. Huh? This is are the gluons. The gluons themselves carry a color charge. I like that they have a charge. This means they interact, they, interact, they interact with each other. This is different completely from the photons in QED, where the photons, they don't have a charge, okay? Conclusion from these two bullets here that I'm trying to say, hadrons have quarks inside. If they have three quarks, we call them baryons. If they have two quarks, we call them mesons. The quarks, interact with each other by a strong interaction governed by PCD, and this interaction make a change of the gluons, and the gluons have the charge. This means the gluons also can interact with each other because they have a charge, and they can multiply, and you can have more gluons, which we'll talk later about it. This means the number of the gluons is not really to be inside. You have three quarks, for example, in baryons, but the gluons can be more, okay? You have what we call, uh, if the high density of the gluons goes up, which we talk about later about all of class form insects, which is coming. But I don't want to, I want to be focused here. All known hadron states 
follows similarly. This means all the quarks together, each one has a charge, but the total charge of the hydro is mostly uh, colorless. They don't have a color because they cancel each other. Okay? The baryons, they have three, as I said, the mesons, there is two. In particular, no free quarks have ever been detected. Nobody saw the quarks in any detector. We just assume there is quark missing. But we all detect the baryons and the mesons by using detector. We know we have the, if we saw the particle, we know this is proton. We look into the mass or something else in charge. And this is neutron, or this is lambda, or sigma, or count prime. This one has been in certain our detector, but the three quarks now. This means we still under this by this data. Okay. What's happening if you put them all together? We try to separate them. All I'm saying here is everything is based on the theory of quantum thermodynamics. This is what the theory is telling us, is teaching us. The interaction between color charges. And thus, between quarks is done to the gluon, particularity of carrying a proton, and they interact with themselves. This means the gluon, they interact because they have charge. This is an important feature of the strongly interaction, interaction that gives its properties. Now, but if we want to pull the two quarks from each other uh, in PCB, we have the potential uh, for the long distance. There is one for the long distance, and there is one for short distance which I will show you the next. For the long distance the potential is called V long is K L. This means with a linear with R, more you put forces to pull them out, the potential becomes strong. Okay, because it's as a function of R. Bigger the R becomes, the R is the distance between the center, center of the two quarks. Okay. Rashid, some out. people are having trouble with the sound. Uh, maybe you can increase the volume. Uh, there are some also uh, some uh, sure, sure. Uh, point. Uh, uh, at some point, the connection. I'm not sure if your internet connection is there a problem on your side there. No, I don't have any connection problem. You mean I should go slowly to make sure that the slide match each other? Uh, Do you uh, hear me now? Yeah, I hear you now. Uh, let, let's okay. Let's continue. Yeah. We'll okay. 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 I will try to go slowly, making sure that. Uh, this means the potential between the two quarks is linear, and it's kr, and more the distance is bigger, the potential starts to be stronger, and for this potential try to keep the two quarks close to each other. If one tries to, uh, to pull the string apart, this means pull them out from each other, when the energy is stored in the, the, inside the system, this means inside the hadron, the system has a tendency to create another quark, anti-quark, as we see here, automatically based on the energy on board. More energy you put, the high probability of pulling them out these two guys, they will create another quark on the quark. And you end up at the end, based on the energy involved, with two hadrons or two mesons in this case. Okay. This is this is another new one, another hadrons, mesons, and this is another one. Okay. This is what the confinement and street break. And confinement is the potential keeping the two quarks inside the hadrons, and string breaking is pulling them away from each other and creating another quark on quark. Let's talk about now what's happening when the distance is very close, small between the two quarks, okay? What we talk about, asymptotic freedom of the quark, of the QCD, okay? At a short distance between the quark and QCD, they are described by V short. In the previous slide, we said V long, this one is V short, is four thirds of alpha S divided by R. As you see here, alpha S we call the coupling constant between the two quarks. And R is the distance between the two quarks. As you see here, 
the smaller distance comes between the two quarks, the potential get more stronger here. It's the opposite of the previous one, which is V long. This one is the V short, okay? And this one, a small distance, this one become big, okay? All the potential become stronger. It's very hard to pull them up, but the coupling test is only with R, okay? When it goes, R go to mostly to zero, alpha S is very small number. And when alpha S is a small, we can do calculation with like this. This is what you call perturbation theory. We can apply it. And alpha S, the coupling constant between the two parts, has been measured by other experiments from the last year. We use a proton probe, as you see here. And they found that the alpha S is the order of 0 to 11 plus minus something small number 0 to 007. This means we know from the calculation and the measurement that alpha s can be used and we can extract this uh, potential and we can do the calculation. All this is in PCB, okay? In 2003, as you know, uh, Rick or Latinis here in July that declared that there is new states has been created and there is gluons and, uh, and there is new state which is dense and hot, which is an indication that the meson is strongly interaction. Very quickly after that, there is discussion about they have a Nobel Prize in 2004 by, this is the theorist, David Ross and David Fritzer and uh, Frank Richard. They get the Nobel Prize about this theory that there is quarks and there is gluons exchange and the science, I mean here they were written, the scientists awarded this year Nobel Prize in physics have solved the mystery surrounding the strongest of nature for fundamental forces. The three quarks within the protons can, some, can sometimes appear to be three, although no three quarks have been observed. The quarks have a quantum mechanics property for color and interact with each other. All this has been really proven by many experiments and lots of measurements by from the CERN and also as for Kevin that the quark, this strongly interaction and formation of the dense matter exists. Okay. We talk about the confinement of the quark inside the hadrons. We talk about string breaking. Now let's talk about deconfinement. Deconfinement, this means let's free the quarks from the hadrons. As we talked before, the proton has three quarks and the neutrons also on the pines. And all of them are inside here, uh, inside the, uh, the nucleus. And we try to break them. How we do that? We do that by heating the system and freezing the top part, or by compression. This is what NASA is doing. And if you do that, you can form, you can free the quarks from inside the hadrons, and you can have them free quarks and gluons in bigger volume. Okay? What you this means what's happen if you compress and heat the matter so the individual hadrons start to enter penetrate? Latius PCD predict that if the system hadrons is brought to certain, uh, certain large density and very high temperature, a deconfinement phase transit should occur. This is what we learn from the lattice QCD. Lattice, this means calculation of quantum chromodynamic. It's telling us if you hit the system, you will break the quark from inside the hadrons. If the new phase called quark gluon plasma, quark and gluon are no longer confined inside the hadron, but they are free to move. This is what lattice is telling us. And how we can prove this one? But people, I mean, the scientists build very big complex of computing, which is required by large species, a lot of calculation, and they do the calculation of the quarks, space, discretization of space, time, and the momentum also. And there is a big computing facility, for example, that you have, and we call it PCP US, Japan, two sections. This is the US side, this is the Japanese side, huge computing facility, just doing the calculation. And here, what you see on the left side, here, this animation, is the largest calculation and showing us the interaction between the quarks and 
and the blue ones inside the medium of the city matter. This is what this is. This is an animation of this. Okay. Also, lattice gave us some results. This is very popular plot. And here, this is the energy of the system. When you collide two nuclei to each other, it creates system. This is energy of the system, energy density of the system, divided by the temperature as function of temperature at the critical point, which I will talk about, which is here. Okay. This is what is the formula for uh, this is for gas, Boltzmann, uh, Stephen Boltzmann gas for free particles. This means Everybody know this calculation that this is for the particles which doesn't interact with each other. It's free particles without no interaction. But we know that if you see the medium, you have quarks and quarks, the gluons and quarks by exchange with each other, and as well as quarks by exchange of gluons. If we look this one, this is the calculation from uh, let's just a zero baryon density and for three flavor, telling us that the system will come and rise. And after that, it's given temperature is going to be class. And this is with a quark gluon interaction. And Stephen Boltzmann, with just three particles of quark antiquarks and gluons, he's saying his limit is around here. This is the limit of the Stephen Boltzmann with three medium of quarks and gluons. As you see here, as function of energy, lattice is telling us that the phase, which is mostly hadron gas, will change to something new, which you call quark gluon plasma, at this point here. And this is what you call, at this point here, the energy density of the system, which you call critical point, is around 0 0.6 GB by uh, photometer cube. Okay? This means, let's put it memorized as around 1 GB, it's very easy. And the transition between the hadron matter and vacuum plasma is happening in this space. This means that it is telling us if you hit the system of quark gluon, uh, hit system of hadrons, you can break it and you can have some quarks and gluons. And this limit is around 80% of Stephen Boltzmann limit. Okay. The question is how we can move from the calculation to the real world, how we can do that. And we can do that by colliding heavy ion collisions at high energy. This means at high temperature and the density. This is the phase diagram come from lattice PCD, as you see it here. This is the temperature, and this is the baryon density. Okay? And the calculation is here, and the critical point is around here. It tells us that if you hit the system, I mean, increase the energy, you can break the hard, uh, the quarks from the hadrons, and you can move to this phase, which is called quark gluon plasma. This region here. And the, he said that the theory, he said that it mostly we are free. This means what we are trying to do. We are with heavy ion collisions. We are trying to see to understand the, the origin of the, the universe. We are trying to see the Big Bang, create the Big Bang in the lab, and after that, go backward and see what is producing. It's producing that, I mean, we have work. And after that, we can go back to the universe, okay? But we are trying to understand the origin of uh, the Big Bang by looking to making collisions at the lab. That's very high energy, and we can detect particles. Conclusion that heavy ion collisions allow us to study complex system by colliding to heavy, governed by the PCD, and understand the fundamental properties of the matter. This is what we are trying to understand. Origin, the universe, as well, the QCD matter. When I say QCD, it's quantum promoting that, okay? I made this slide just to illustrate how the nucleus-nucleus collisions go. Okay. 
Before I talk about the animation that we have in the lines, let's ask this question. We can ask this question. How do we test this theory in the lab? How we can apply this movement in the lab? How can we compress slash the method to high energy density? The idea is by colliding two heavy nuclei. Why heavy? More particles we have, the highest probability to create the medium is positive. Okay. More it gets on board, more nucleus, more the system is hot, and you can break a lot of uh, hot ones. And you have to get a lot of energy involved, which is energy coming from the two. Okay. This means we can create by heavy ion a medium, uh, which is called PCD medium, or quartilion plasma. In short time, the lifetime of this matter is very short. It's 10 to minus 23 seconds. And very quickly hadronized. Let's see, let me come back to this one. As you see here, the two nuclei, uh, or the nucle uh, nucleus nucleus coming, they collide with each other. And after that, they create a medium, and after that, there is a freeze out stage, which is mean you create a medium and the medium cool down. And he what happened, he produced particles. This means what we have in the beginning, we have all the energy of each nucleus, nucleus coming. This means the formula here, which is Einstein formula, E equal gamma mc squared. What's happened? The incoming energy in each nucleus. Nucleus is converted to mass. Okay, you see, in the beginning you have no particle. In the beginning you have only, let's say, gold ball. Every nucleus coming from this side, huh? how much he has? Has protons and neutrons. This is uh, this is mostly the the gold. Is 198 atomic mass. He has 79 protons and he have 180 neutrons. But at the end, at the end, you have mostly 5,000 particles. I will show later huh? in both gold central region. The question, how these new particles come from? The particles come from the energy. The incoming energy in each one of them is converted to the mass by this formula. And gamma here, which called is Lorentz factor, as you remember from that. From classes from the courses that gamma is this formula is Lorentz factor. The v is the speed of moving particles, and c is the speed of light. Okay. One of the questions that we can ask here: We know that gold ball or lead lead have spherical shape. Why they are flat? Why they are oblate here? Why they are flat? Not says. Spherical shape. We also learned that from, from Lorentz contraction that if you take these guys and you accelerate them at speed of light, 99.9% of the speed of light, there is a Lorentz contraction which is mostly in the direction of the direction of the beam. Okay, this will will push. The two, uh, the, the nucleus to be oblate will be contract, and this is what we see here. They are completely oblate shape. This is what we call Lorentz contraction happens when the nucleus comes mostly close to the speed of light. Okay, and they contract by a factor of uh, the hair, for example, at three. At, uh, when you have this acceleration with the 100 uh, GV nucleus, the factor of gamma is mostly at the nucleus by a factor of 100. Okay, this is why the average. Okay, <clears throat> I think we hope that you have some idea about quantum chromodynamics and what we are trying to do and how we can create this new state of mass and how mostly free these quarks and gluons from hadrons by accelerating. Okay. In 1999, okay, the first collider have been built in the United States is it's collide two nucleus. What happened is you see 
In the beginning, you have a tonda, which is for to use the theme. And after that, go to the booster. And this here, two nucleus are accelerated in EGS, and after that, injected in two rings, which I will show later how this is done. In the beginning, we have one beam, but the beams is made from what you call the bunches. Okay, and the bunches of what's that? That's how we find the bunches are, let's say, like a packet, a packet of particles. What you do, you inject one on the right, which you call the, the yellow, and one on the left, and you have these bunches are circulating and accelerated inside the collider. Okay? And after that, you steer them and you do the collisions at different experiments. What do we have here? We have experiments. This is for both experiments, and this is Brahms experiments. They are detector when I say experiments, to detect them. This is a star and finish. We have four experiments in the beginning, and these four experiments were built to make sure that each one of them discover something. The other one has to confirm. This means we can compare the result between different experiments to make sure that the uh, experimental observation is correct. And this is very crucial. As you see, for example, also right now, at week we have two experiments comparing the measurements at Alashi. We have also several experiments, Large Hadron Collider, we have Atlas, we have Alice, we have CMS, we have RCB. And all these we have to cross each other, the measurements, and also we can com add, combine the data and also look for the new signals. Okay, I show this one as you have the A collider is always here and after that the red, which is two rings. The circumference of the rig is around mostly four kilometers. Okay, there are two independent rings. This means there is two beam, and after that you can steer them and make collisions. As I said, every ring can have bunches. Bunches, I said, is a packet of particles. And and these bunches are mostly short part. They have collision very quickly. Rick is capable to accelerate a lot of species. This means a lot of uh, nucleus. For example, you can do gold, you can do uranium, you can do aluminium, you can do copper. This is what you call species, different atoms, okay, ions. And also, it can reach high energy, like 500 GV per nucleus for proton proton and 200 GV because it has a lot of particles for gold core and the other system. One unique capability of this accelerator relativistic heavy ion collider is has also polarization. As you know that the nucleus, for example, uh, the, the nucleon proton have a spin. And the spin, you can orient it. You can make it longitudinal or transverse. And you can collide. This is what you call spin polarization. And this is unique to this machine. OK? As you see here, from 2000 starting up to 2016, this machine collider produced a huge lot of type of particles from gold gold to proton proton, D gold, copper, and this is symmetric system. And after that switch to an asymmetric system, this means you have a deuteron from one side and both from the other side collide each other. And you have proton. And also uranium, copper gold. And recently we start to, want to be interested by small system to see if there is a pair, if there is quarkion plasma in a small system also. And this happened at different energies from mostly let's say scan you can make a collisions by changing the energy and you see okay what's happening how many particles I'm produced am I producing quark prisma I'm creating the, the quark uh, and gluons from inside nucleons and you can do all this systematic stuff the rig as I saw you as I told you before inside the tunnel 
all the accelerator, uh, mostly the ring, are underground, as I showed before, okay? There is two pipes or two beam lines. As I showed before, there is one going the red, we call the blue beam, and one the yellow beam. And after that, you collide them. That's the experiment, as you see here. In the beginning, the acceleration is one MEV per nucleon. After that, you take it to EGS. And after that, you take it to the red, which is now 100 GV every beam, okay? And this is different components. This is the tandem when the beam is ejected, and you go to all the lines. Okay, as you see here, if you just go to Google and you type "rig" or the relativity scaling coil, as you see, what this is the first and one of only two operating heavy ion colliders. Okay, it's very important. For, it's one of them, but it's the only polar, uh, only machine we can do the polarization of the protons, and it's with no good camera. What do you mean one of the two? What is the second one? The second one is the large hadron collider at uh, uh, at Star. Okay, this one here is the second machine for to study uh, uh, relative heavy ion collision. Okay, and as you see this one, the, 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 the ring here, circumference of the machine is around four kilometers, but I think the large circumference is around twenty-three kilometers. Here. This means you can go to the highest energy you can do. You can go by a factor, I believe it's 10. This means you can study the medium at 50. But when you go to large, you can study the same system that that or gold or there is something wrong between that and gold because the Z, the number of the protons for gold is around 79, is 79. And for that is around is 82. This means that close to each other. Is the same physics. This one you can go 10 times the energy of the ring, and this is the Here you have also other experiments, which is called uh, Alice, uh, which I will talk about, and it's dedicated 100 percent for EV ion collisions. Uh, Mr. Rashid, could you, yes. stop the, could you stop the video there? Uh, because then the bandwidth gets squeezed, and, and, and when, you, when the video is going and you are talking, um, we don't hear very well what you are saying. Uh, I'm not sure. My you... Go ahead. Okay. And uh, I go here. What do you want me to do here? No, I said the, the embedded video that is on the side. I stop uh, video. Yeah, uh, I mean, that uh, embedded video that is on the side uh, of your, uh, of that page that you are showing, you know, the, um, which page were you on? Um, when you are showing the week and the LHC, yeah, could you go back to that page? Yes, so yeah. Yes. The, yeah, that small uh, video on the left side there, that said, Latin. Yeah. Uh, if you can just yes. stop it while, yeah. when you are talking, yeah. that would be better because uh, when it is playing, then we are not able to hear your you yes. very well. I see you. Let me take it like this. Okay. I believe it's much better now. It's gone. Yeah, it's, it's much better. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yes. I was saying that, I mean, there is two colliders. There is the relative TV and collider, and there is the Alashi. These two machines are really complementary. I mean, they work with each other, and this one goes to the highest energy, uh, which is mostly 2 TV, and this one goes to 284 volt. And it's very important to study the matter, which is as a function of energy, okay, when it's changing.
let's let me show you this here. I mean, when you want to study this matter, which is mostly uh, you have poly this is the evolution of PV ion collision. Okay, and when you do this collision, you come to this two nuclear uh, nucleus and you collide them. In the beginning, you when they go into each other at very high energy, you have hard processes. The interaction is so strong between the between the particles in the beginning, and after that, what you call the system expand because they go to each other. And after that, I saw the animation before. And after that, you produce particle, you produce the medium, and after that, you produce particles, and then there is a freeze out. Okay. At the freeze out, you have all these particles that you see in your detector. But in your detector, you don't really see these phases. What you see, you see the particle produced, as you see them here. You see the photon, the pions, the pi, the jet. The jet is the collision when you hit these two uh, nucleus. Okay. Anyway, the question is by detecting these particles, we can different phases. If I want a phase in the beginning, I go directly and I look to, for example, let's say I look to the photons, I look to the jet, I look to gypsy. This one gave this particle gave me information about initial state. If I want to study the final state, the free zone, this one here, this is the free zone stage, I just go to the pines, photons and kinds and I take a look. This means the particle that you see, you observe in your detector, can give you information about the space time of the evolution of the collision. And this is very important. Okay? By looking to the particle, I can tell you what is happening in the system at different spaces. What is, there is a hard, uh, hard processes, there's hydronization, and there is also the freeze out. The freeze out is mean when all the, this medium blow up to different particles and expand and go down. This mean QGP study principle is the particle produced are used for the property of the system formed during the collision. Okay? Good. So and before I move to the next slide, yes. Yeah, there is a request if you can. Uh, yes, Kitabi? Yes, there is a request if you can summarize the previous slide a little bit because there we, uh, we didn't hear very much uh, because of the. Yeah, if you can we summarize this slide. Uh. Sure. Okay, let me go back a little bit. This is okay. Uh, I mean, here this is the rig where you have different components. <laughs> different components. Different components and uh, of the, the relative to KVN collector. Here, what you have is you have two facilities. You have the relativistic KV ion collider, and you have the second one, which is, has been uh, built in operational since 2010. This is the Large Hadron Collider. The rig here is mostly built to study relativistic collisions and also the polarized protons. And here also is for high energy physics, but also can do heavy ion physics by, for example, in Alice, this experiment, mostly 100% dedicated to relativistic heavy ion collisions. And you have other group also uh, working in ATLAS, LSTB, and the CMS. Okay? These facilities are complementary, and you can study the quantum plasma at different energy. Okay? Uh, I, tell you, I, hear, I hear some noise. Um, let you mute someone? Uh, okay. And here I explained that different phases of the heavy ion collisions, which you have the partons in the beginning, and you have freeze out, and also you have uh, hard processes. And we use the particle to study the medium. Okay? Yes. 
So I think we have the kids. Okay. Would you please mute if you can, your side? Thank you. Okay, I mean, you produce all these particles. Before I go to the next slide, I would like to introduce uh, uh, another uh, uh, parameter, which is called eta, it's a pseudo rapidity. I mean, every particle is going in the space, has a momentum, and this is the direction of the beam. This pseudo rapidity quantity is mostly the, the polar angle between the uh, particle coming out and the z axis of the beam, and it's as a function of theta, okay? This is the pseudo rapidity. I will talk about this in the lecture number two. So, in details, but I just want to introduce this quantity, which is called pseudo rapidity, and also we have another one for rapidity. This means every particle in space has his parameter for uh, which it can be defined, okay? This is just claims about what we can learn from producing particles that they talk about ions and uh, gypsum and uh, protons and all of them. You can collect all these particles, okay? And you look at their position in space, which is the pseudo rapidity here, and you can look at function of centrality. For example, you can take a system ball ball, uh, different energies from the lowest energy to the highest energy. And also it can to copper copper from 22 to up to 200 GV. And you can look for other systems. Uh, uh, that is possible that uh, the person can you? There is one has a speaker on. David, do you hear me? Yes, it's muted already, Rashid. Ah, okay, I heard the kids. Okay. Okay, and uh, what happened, you have different systems, gold, gold, copper, copper, and you look also from older systems, big gold, okay, at 400 uh, MGB, 200 GB. And all these particles here, Wow, there is a lot of noise here. Our producer function of centrality. Octavio, do you have the same noise or not? What's going on here? Okay. Okay. And this is produced particle. What is important from this plot? We try to see that particles produced at mid filtration can give us some information about energy density. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Rashid, I don't. Everybody else except you and I are muted right now. I don't hear noises. Okay. Okay, I hear them on my side. Fine. Uh, what we have here, well, let's be focus here at mid rapidity division, okay, at eta equals zero, you have these produced particles. And here with produced particles at mid rapidity division, we can extract the energy density, okay? And this is what one of the most important results at the beginning of the, uh, the read. And this is the particle produced in this detector in four balls. The, the number of particles produced in the collision is around 5,000 particles at 200 GB and around 20 particles around PP. The smaller system you have, the less, the lowest energy you can, the lowest particle you can get. And if you use the Bjorken model, which is just an approximation, which is this formula here, and you replace by the number of particles here, huh, you can find that the energy density produced in heavy ion collision in gold gold is around 5 GB, and this result is very important that 5 GB is bigger one from the critical energy needed by lattice facility, which is 1, 1 GB. Automatically, that the medium created a tree has the energy density higher than the one expected lattice facility, and this is, can be a very indication that there is a medium has been created, 
and the, the theories, Lossi and Larry McLaren, McLaren, they publish very quickly that there is a possibility that the quark you know, is produced as well because the energy density is so high, there is a possibility that before forma the formation of quark neon plasma, there is another state has been created called color plasma, which is mostly dominated by the gluons. Okay? And this is what we will talk about in the next slide. This is one of the first indications that something is going on. <coughs> and I think this is what we have here. I think we have a show. We have two big experiments. We've got Phoenix and Star. Okay? Yeah, Rashid. And this is really. Rashid, yeah, yeah would, that. Yes. The, the video there is. Yeah, so we move to the next slide. Please. Yeah, it causes problem every time it's running, yeah. then we just don't hear you at all. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. One of the big experiments is PINIT, is pioneering high energy nuclear interaction experiment. And what they have, we have two spectrometer at the <coughs> at speed rapid division. The detect photons, hadrons, and electrons. And also, uh, we have two spectrometer fronts and back for to detect the muons. And uh, three detectors, I mean, for global, de uh, global detector for uh, centrality and luminosity. But, Kitabi, uh, I hear a huge noise in this, my side. I don't know what's really going on. Maybe the speaker is slightly high. Yes, I think it's the speaker, much better now. Yeah. <coughs> and we have global detectors. This is one of the big experiments. And at Mitra Vitti region, we have silicon detector. We have a pixels, and I will talk about them very uh, in the next slide. Mostly, every detector tries to have different type of sub detector <coughs> that you can mostly detect all the particles produced from the sun. Here, we have an even display. We have an even display la, la, la. produced by Phoenix. You can see all the particles produced, for example, from gold gold collision. Yeah. And this is the Phoenix detector I can use, one of them. In the middle, you have the silicon detector, which is mostly, as you see here, this is the most advanced technology. For the silicon, we have the pixels, and we have a strip behind it, yeah? and they are located at mid rapid definition. Why the silicons? Because the silicon detectors can give you information, I mean, good, uh, it can give you good information about the space resolution of the particles, and it can help you to study the heavy flavor, which I will show later, that they are important to study the, the properties of the music. As you see here, let me go to the cartons. Uh, if we have this proton, for example, collide with this proton, huh? when they collide, they produce demisons. Yeah? And after demisons can decay to electrons, E plus E minus. No. And after what you do, you take the two tracks. And you can define the distance closed approach, PCA. We know that the demisons, the lifetime is mostly 123 microns. This is how big for microns. And this is 464 microns, the lifetime. You can very easily make the separation between the heavy quarks, like demisons or these, and you can look to the property of the metal. Here is just illustration. If you collide a small, nucleons, like proton proton, we have just few particles, three or four tracks, but it depends on energy. If you, this is a 200 GV observed by the silicon detector. Now, if you go to 2 TV, you have more particles because more energy you put, more particles are produced. Look here, if you have more particles, but you do the same thing at the same 200 GV, you have mostly, let's say, 5,000 particles produced for the most central collisions here, okay? This is important, right? When you do, we do the integration. 
this is very important. This is a big difference between complex system and a bi and you can look to the detector for correlation for probability centrality. And also for every collision, there is vertex. And this is the size of the beam which is coming in. Okay. You see how much is complex when you go to the heavy ion that you have more particles than you have the small when you collide the small particle like proton proton. By using this, what they show before, you can look for the separation of the tracks. And you can look to the CID decomposition by using the silicon detector. And this is just an example here, for example, gold, gold. And this is the distribution BCA, which I showed before here. Huh? And you can plot this one for different, for hadrons, for Dallas decay, which is another type of particles. And you can extract your sigma and K gypsi. And you can extract your sigma. You can have your fraction of the B and the charm which is going decaying from the beam is going to electrons. This is just type of measurements that you can do and accept the information. And you can also, this is for electrons here going forward. And you can also do it for dimions. Muons is another type of particles which you can also study the heavy flavor coming from the muons, okay? This is just a flavor of type of measurements why you need the detectors. You need the detector to identify particles, and you can do physics with it. Okay, and this, the more the detector is sophisticated and has good resolution and good timing, you can do better physics to understand. There is also a, other experiment which has relatively similar and different detectors that you can have different type of measurements. For example, this one is this is a star, sinusoidal tracker at rig. It has a lot of also detector. They can be uh, can measure particles, and you can compare. You can compare star to Phoenix measurement. But you see here, you have, for example, you have the magnet. You need the magnetic field that you can bend the particle, and you can measure them. You have a tough, which is time of fly. You can measure, you can identify the particles. You have a BBC, and here they put a new detector we call the Muon telescope detector. They can and see the muons and they can use it to identify particles. By identifying particles, you can reconstruct uh, the, the different invariance mass. And this is just a highlight. This is a look from inside as a big experiment. Uh, it's like similar from uh, for LHT. And you have different type of detector, very complex system. And this is animation I know is going slow in your side. This is one single event in four pi detected by, uh, by TPC in star. And you see how these particles go into the space. Huh? It's very, very, really amazing how every particle has been observed and tracked using this, uh, the TPC time projection channel. Using this kind of detectors, you can also have the meson feature talk about it. This is different type of particles, for B0 and different plus minus and D short. This is, for example, uh, mesons. When I say mesons, this means they have two quarks and they have S uh, quark. And uh, you have this one, they have a charm quarks. And you can study each one of them and you by looking just to the P and make a cut here and do different physics. Okay, for example, looking for a uh, nuclear, uh, for example, for the flow for this part. This is what I showed before the telescope, muon telescope. They observe muons. And if you take two muons, the tracks, okay, and you do the invariance mass, which I will talk about this also, you can make this reconstruct the gypsum peak. And you can look to the epsilon. And by making a cut around this peak, you can look. For observable, like elliptic flow, like nuclear modification factor, it's you there is something going on with the medium or not. Which is most important here in this part that you detect all the particles produced from the collision. This is the main message. You don't, you should not miss a lot of them. This is one also a large experiment at LHC, which is running now, taking the data 
this is ADIS, a large ion collider experiment, and also have TPC, steam error detector for that we have a trick, but the collision is at high energy. Okay, this means you produce more particles, this means the medium maybe can be different or similar, but this is what you want to compare. You want to compare what happened at RIC and RFC. Okay, this is a view of the detector, it's huge, it's very important. I mean, what I'm trying to say to the, the students here that it's important to know the physics and the theory, but also it's crucial that you know how to get involved and how to build these detectors. There is different type of detector. There is silicon detector, electromagnetic detector. You need to have expertise in your hand, such a way that you can really, at the beginning, you can join such experiments. Physics, detector construction is very important. And you need to get involved in different experiments and you can learn from other people how they are doing, okay? This is mostly the main focus on this lecture number one is somehow we talk a little about the physics motivation, we talk about the basic idea of quantum chromodynamic, and we also talk about detectors and how these particles are detected and why they are detected, and why we need them. The second part of the lecture, this is where we are going to mostly talk about. How did we discover this quark in plasma? I mean, we made the collisions, we produced particles, we built a lot of detectors, a lot of, uh, uh, we put a lot of money, a lot of manpower. How did we project ourselves? And also, we talk to you about future projects and opportunity. We should join this experiment. This is mostly a highlight of the discovery. This is just glimpse about the lecture number two. This is the highlight of the discovery of quark neon plasma in 2005 that it has been observed by the four experiments. And also, it has been the research has been published, and it mostly was all around the world that quark neon plasma has been performed. However, we were thinking that when you collide these two nucleus nucleus together at high energy, we are thinking that we will form a gas with free quarks and gluons flying like this. But we found that is not true. It was not a gas. It was a liquid. We formed a liquid with, high, with very low viscosity, which is called perfect liquid, because the viscosity of this liquid is more smaller than the water. Okay? And this is mostly what was on the news, water everywhere. And what you see here, Greek scientists serve a perfect liquid. It's not a gas. Okay, this is glimpse for the, the next one. We will talk about the kinematic variable for the collisions, centrality, and also energy density, transfer momentum. This is just a kinematic. And after that, we talk about that the, predict that the prediction that we are expecting which was gas of quark neon plasma. It was not gas, it was a liquid. And we'll show, I will show you already the signature how we found that with the jet quenching, which is create very dense and opaque medium, and also the measurements of elliptic flow that the quark neon plasma has it behaves as a perfect liquid. We will talk also that recently we found that this quark neon plasma is not just created as in a big system, but it's possible also is created in small system like a big old stuff. This means what is most important is the energy. And one very important part is that after the discovery of this new matter, now we have to study the property of the matter of quark neon. And we study this by looking for heavy probes, by using the heavy probes like quarkonia and looking to the hard and dense medium by using gypsum or epsilon and looking for different probes. Okay? Because as I showed before in one slide, that the gypsum and epsilon are coming from the beginning from the beginning of the Polish hard processes. And also at the end, I will talk to you about that we are moving from relativity heavy and collider. There is a new project of two billion dollars that for Kevin have been approved that we are moving to electron ion collider that we can 
study really the when we talk about the opportunities, which is mostly uh, which is exists mostly at both areas, San and also Africa, so national lab, and it's clear that we need a lot of students and people who take over and run these experiments for the future. This is a highlight from the result of the next lecture. We will talk about this and many results. What the mis what the mis uh, the, the, the medium created. I mean, when you follow this with this one here, it creates a medium in the middle here, and of what happened that the quarks interact by change of gluons, and these create jets. And this is how we can measure here. We can call the nuclear modification factor here, and we can plot it as function of transverse momentum. And you see how much the difference between uh, collision of proton protons and gold gold, and this is if it's below one is fast. This is also comparison between SPS, which is very low energy, RIC and Alashi. How we see that RIC and Alashi mostly agree with each other that there is a medium and Alashi can go to very high PT. And also, we talk about this kind of stuff about the creation of the medium. In small systems, and this is something new that you are not expected. We are thinking just the biggest uh, nuclear cities, the, the biggest medium created, but there is possibility that also is created in small systems. Okay, I think this is all I have for the lecture one, and I hope that uh, we learn something from it. Not everything, but I think uh, uh, if we get a message for the last experience collision, I think it's uh, it's important for the. Uh, Rashid, uh, thank you very much for the for the lecture. And sorry, there were some static and uh, noise on thank the you. way. But uh, this uh, is really really appreciated. All the effort that uh, you put into uh, compiling such a comprehensive uh, lecture for us. Uh, thanks again. So we're going to move into the uh, question and answer as, uh, uh, session. Uh, Mohammed, you have questions. Uh, Yes, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Chief, for the valuable lecture. Um, uh, uh, I'm having like uh, four uh, questions. The first uh, one is about the uh, color uh, confinement uh, you talked about at the beginning that. Uh, Quarks and uh, gluons are uh, be uh, uh, confined in in a hadron. Um, uh, I didn't uh, quite get the reason for this. Any uh, is there a a, a specific uh, theoretical uh, explanation for this that uh, I might Look into you. I mean, you are saying why we have gluons inside the, the hadrons with the quarks, or yes, yes. I I, uh, I want to know uh, more about the, the reason why there is a uh, confinement in essence. Yeah, so yeah, I mean, why? Go ahead, Rashid, yeah. please. Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 no. I was just going to repeat the question, but it looks like it's clear for you. So, no, go ahead, repeat it, just making sure. Uh, yeah, no, I, I believe the, yeah, the question is about uh, uh, the, the QCD property of confinement. So, uh, if there is a theoretical motivation uh, for that, and yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah, go ahead, please. I mean, we, we learned from the QED that, uh, that the, uh, the things particle interact by exchange of photons, which doesn't have a charge. I mean, the quantum chromodynamic is a theory of the standard model. And I mean, and this is a theory. I mean, it can happen that in the future, I mean, nobody observed the quarks free. I mean, if you have a new idea, I mean, that would be, would be amazing if you can publish it. Is that quarks? I mean, we assume that there's a quarks inside these nucleons, and there is 
these quarks interact with each other. This is the theory which is telling us they interact with each other by exchange of gluons. And you need something that will be exchanged between, they have a charge, the quark. You need something which can be exchanged between two components. And this is what the theory is saying. It's saying there is a gluon. I mean, there is no proof that you have to observe gluons or quark, but this is just a, a quantum, what they can tell. I mean, this is a quantum chromodynamic. It's telling us this is what's going on. And, uh, the question is, are you, I mean, if you can ask me, is really gluons inside the, the hadrons? No, we never observed the gluons. We never observed the quark. This is what we assume. Yes. So, but uh, there, is, there, is a, there is a, just one thing. I mean, also at week, when they collide this heavy ion strong, they produce a lot of particles. There is a model called color glass condensate, which is mostly based only on the gluons, has a lot of gluons inside. And it looks, if you use this model, you can reproduce the data of particles very nicely. It's like you are saying, oh yeah, there is gluons, because they are produced by the model. It's a theory, just uh, proof. There is no experimental proof. Yes, so uh, we have the, uh, the uh, facilities to uh, detect quarks, uh, um, uh, did not uh, uh, detect them uh, yet. So we, we uh, I we, mean, we, we don't have, detect quarks. Okay, so we have the ability to detect, detect them. Uh, so you know it the there was but we know that the quarks are there right there were experiments uh, that were done uh, called uh, you know deep in elastic scattering where okay. you shoot electrons of very 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 high energy for example into the photon and then you see what how the the pattern of the scattering at the end and it was shown that uh, you know um you know when you, you know you have high energy yeah if you if the energy is not high then the electron doesn't penetrate into the proton it just scatter off the surface but that's what they call it deep inelastic so it goes in there and then when you study the scattered electron you can infer that uh, the electron must have scatter off of something very hard inside the photon yeah and uh, so that's how we had evidence that mm. the quarks do exist. Mm -hmm. They are hard objects inside the photons. Yes. Yeah. But then, then, then you can say, okay, fine. If I give the electrons high enough energy, yeah. can I knock out one of the quarks and have an isolated quark? Yes. You know, yeah. Uh, just like in box, bo boxing, you know, if you knock somebody on 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 on. <laughs> On the map, you can knock out a thief uh, yeah. or a tooth. Yeah. So let's let's take that analogy. So you give the electron high, high enough energy. You know that it's scattered of is scattering off of something hard, but you are not able to knock out just that quark and to have it free. That's exactly the problem of you know the confinement. You know the quark will always yeah. appear with. With another quark and become a hadron, uh, which either is made of three quark or two quark. So we have solid evidence that the quark exists. Yes. But we have the property that they don't exist by themselves in free space as isolated particles. Right. So uh, is this uh, has to do uh, with uh, short range uh, uh, property of the. Uh, the uh, strong force that uh, it's it's um, uh, it acts on the very small scales, so we 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 cannot uh, that uh, like the quark cannot escape uh, the, the strong force uh, it's been affecting. On it. Is that right or not? 
Yeah, but still, right. if you answer, I mean, the, 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 the right. I mean, more, you, more you try to separate them, as you see here in the slide, the uh, spring breaking, yes, more you yes. try to separate them, more you create a particle. And how much energy? You will never, I mean, they have a tendency to create work instead of work, and you create more hard ones because you put more energy, then you break them by themselves. See what I mean? Your, your, your function is correct. And I would like to add something. I mean, even in deep in elastic, I mean, for the quarks, uh, we we say is the constituent quark. It's not really quark. We say there is a constituent quark when the photon goes in. And uh, the question is, what is constituent quark? It's really a quark or something around it, or by mistake. But you have the which is you have the, the deep in elastic. It depends who is talking also. Yeah, it's an interpretation. Okay, so, um, okay, so uh, I have uh, another uh, question uh, about the, uh, the uh, collider that, uh, that was uh, operating at the uh, Fermi lab, that is the uh, Tevatron. Uh, I'm asking, uh, I know that the Tevatron has uh, shut down because it couldn't uh, match with the uh, energies of the air age. Just uh, wondering what is the difference between uh, the, the, I mean, why uh, Rick is still operating when we have uh, the uh, Alice experiment, for example, at the end. What does it offer uh, more than Alice? It is, it's, uh, it's very easy. I mean, uh, as you know, the first discovery, it was at Rick, and uh, the regime of energy of the Rick is lower than, than the one that we have in LHC, correct? Yes, yes. And uh, right now, there is new experiment called as Phoenix is going to be uh, is underway to replace Phoenix. And this one, they can measure uh, the particles at very high momentum. We have to compare the results from high energy and other energy to make sure what you observe is these two complementary measurements. You see what yes. I mean? It's, yes. It's, I mean the. The nuclear, uh, the nuclear modification factor and the signature that you observe at Rick, do you see exactly behaving the same way when you go to high energy? Let's say tomorrow Alice discovers something new at given energy, at LHC, okay? okay? And he said this is a direct measurement of the quark -lium, uh, quark lium plasma. It's unique to this. The second question, the do we see this signature at other energy at Rick? Or this is unique to this energy at Rick? Yes. You yes. can go back and you say, oh, okay, I have to run Rick and I have to measure this. Do I see the signal? This is really two complementary facilities. And uh, uh, there is another uh, uh, location for heavy ion is coming in the future. I think it's 2030. Or 35 coming from the EGS. Yeah. You know? Okay. Uh, I think there is, uh, yeah, it's a CDM and all the experiments they are going to measure at very, very low energy. Just want to make a map of the transition phase. I think it's, it's crucial to have different facilities at different energies. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, I was just uh, uh, confused about the. the uh, the throne uh, was uh, shut down just because and it's, it's, uh, it uh, couldn't uh, match the energies at the LHC, so I, I didn't know why it was shut down. Yeah. It's, it's crucial. Maybe I can see something yeah. there. You know, uh, the yeah. Tivatron was running at uh, 2 TeV and LHC yes. energy became, you know, quite high at 14 TeV. Yes. And LHC had, uh, you know, four detectors around the ring. Um, 
you know, so and then there were as well many people from the from the Tivatons that were also involved at the LHC. So there are many different factors uh, beyond uh, just the the differences in the in, in the energy. Yeah. yeah. So there were also uh, you know consolidating efforts in the high energy physics community. So um, yeah, you know they. The, the, all of the things, the Stevatron had provided us with valuable measurement already, including the discovery of the top quark. And all those things became essential at the LHC. And uh, therefore, you know, it's, 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 it became much, much better to consolidate the effort and to get the US community involved at the LHC where we can review or we can do the things that the Stevatron was doing and do uh, uh, more stuff at the LHC and then redirect the efforts, uh, you know, at Fermilab to other crucial and important physics. And so since the Tivaton was shut down, Fermilab has developed more and more in Trino physics package. Yes. And then, but then they are also heavily involved in CMS at the LHC. So uh, the effort is not completely the experience of the Tevatron, you know, did not uh, really disappear. So I think it was reconsolidated. It has a uh, uh, human capacity factors, uh, you know, uh, financial and consolidation of uh, the high high energy physics experimental, uh, uh, you know, effort. So in the end, it was actually quite uh, quite good for high energy physics to do it like that. Uh, the case of the of the heavy ion, um, I think like uh, Dr. Rashid was saying, um, you know, there are different uh, regimes of, uh, of, uh, of cooperation and complementarity that, uh, uh, that, that dictated uh, maintaining the rig. And as well, like he mentioned, the rig uh, now is going to go to, uh, you know, the uh, electron ion collider, which is really the next phase that the LHC is not going to have. So they couldn't have just done that by shutting it down and then coming back now and say that, uh, you know, let's go to the electron ion collider. So it had to be, you know, it has to be continued. Although they consolidated as well, you know, the rig also used to have four experiments, that, like that Dr. Uh, Rashid said, then they consolidated into two major one, uh, you know, and then, um, and then now there is a future for that. Yeah. So you can see the direction and, and the reason for motivating the decisions on the side, on both sides of the Atlantic. Yeah, and, uh, uh, so, and since we are also relying on public money and uh, we want to make sure that our uh, efforts and money and, are not really wasted. So, if the LHC can carry forward what we have learned from the Tevatron and do the same stuff, then uh, it's, you know, it's reasonable not to have both of them going and then redirect the effort at Fermilab, which is what they did. If the rig can have a complementarity area to the LHC, then it makes sense to keep it, to keep it going in parallel. Okay, um, I would like to add something. I mean, okay, yeah, just one thing. I mean, you know, in physics, in physics, there is also what you call the long branch plan. I mean, uh, every 10, 15 years, uh, the physics community uh, meets with each other and say, what's next? What we could do next? I mean, you cannot continue doing the same thing forever and not looking forward. I mean, for example, all this progress that we are doing in LHC or at RIC at the United States is based on the long branch plan. This means we are doing heavy ion physics now, we are discovering this. Let's give five years again <clears throat> for the RIC to run until 2026, 20, 2028, 20, that we can study the property of this matter and compare the result to, to the to the LHC with the Alice and others. But the next phase will be keeping the rig, but moving to electron ion collider, which is mostly $2 billion. And it are going to have two new detectors. And we have also 
not just ion ion or proton proton you will have ion you will have proton and you will have electron this means and to really amazing physics if you found something can you ask for yourself what i can do with electron proton or electron ion or something like that this is a new physics and i think this is is driven by every time something shut down is not the end of the world because yes. something will be born after that will be bigger and i think this is what uh, the physics community right now i think this is the right path that we are doing we have to move further further and to learn more new things yes yes i understand okay um uh, so uh, can we uh, please go to the eta curves the uh, pseudo rapidity that um, you had like uh, three columns of yeah. data one slide this one yeah 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 yes okay so uh, uh, i was uh, wondering why we have uh, at first why do we have a uh, central shape for the eta curves in all of them uh, the the the, uh, the central shape of, uh, of the curve that is in uh, graphs is uh, is there a reason for it? Uh, what, what the question exactly? You talk about why the shape is like this? Yes, yes. Why it's like? Uh, and why do why do shape why do shape is different? I'm talking about why yes. uh, do, why do we have a central curve about uh, the point zero? I mean, in in all of them we have the the eta values, uh, the 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 even values increase at uh, the eta equals zero, then it goes down again. So. Is there an explanation? Yeah, I think, I think, yes, yes, I mean, let me go back. I, I think I have a cartoon for this one here, if I see it there. Ah, yeah. Let's say this one here. You see, you see this animation small here? Yes. Yeah, when the two letters go into each other, okay? Let's imagine. Going to each other, okay? Okay. When they touch each other, you have the maximum particle production in the collision, you know? And after yes. that, they go through each other, and when they go far away, they have less interaction. This means they have less particles, yes? Yes. This means at the beginning, when they interact at eta zero, which is eta, you have the maximum production of the particles boosted at that region and more they go further you have less particles and this is mostly what we have here is just driven that this region here at eta equals zero is the, the location where the two nucleus hit each other you have a huge production of particles more they go far away from each other because the, so the rapidity is the rapidity is the distance between the two nucleus okay the yes. further they go far from each other the less particle you get the less interaction you have. this is just driven by as the, the you have here i think animation is exactly what you have here you see this animation they yes. come tough. they hit each other they produce a lot of particles they go from each other, they have less particles, and they further. Okay? Yes, so, um, uh, so, uh, can there any particles in a, like, um, if the, uh, if the uh, origin is occurring as the uh, origin, can't we have uh, particles that go uh, with any that are not going uh, vertically upward or 
downward can we have like um, eta that is not uh, vertical? Yeah. I mean, we can have, yeah, from, yes. Yes, I mean, the, 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 every particle has transverse momentum, Pt, yes. and you have the momentum in the z direction, Pz, you know. So, yes. I mean, if the particle hits each other, they, don't, they, don't, they have high transverse momentum when they collide, and they have less transverse Pz uh, in z direction. This means some particles, they don't interact, and they go forward and back, I mean, forward backward direction. Go straight, and this is what they end up in the tails here. See, usually yes. what you say, usually we say, I mean, let's talk about this is what mostly the bulk of the medians created, and this is what we call fragmentation region, is where the particles mostly have high momentum go forward, like a proton thing. So, forward, for example, you have them. This in the middle here are mostly the particles produced by the collisions. They didn't exist before. 95% or 96% uh, are pines. You know, when you come to the collision in the beginning, you have only protons, yes? Yes. You don't have a pine. You don't have a current. And after when you collide, you create these mesons, which you said before, you break these quarks and you combine them again to new particles, which you call the meson spines. And this is mostly the particles which have high transverse momentum are mostly created from the collision. And the particles that you have here are mostly protons coming from the interactions. And you can do particle identification and you can see it. You see what this means? Yes. Some, some particles before one have the longitudinal transverse momentum of it. Right. Um, uh, so uh, at the uh, PP collision in uh, uh, the uh, left column, why are we having like uh, double peaks in the uh, PP graphs at the left? Uh, you mean why you have the B? Yeah. The uh, B deep in the middle. Yeah. What is it? Proton, proton. Yeah, uh, people collisions. Are. Yeah, we have double peaks. Yeah. So. Uh, why you are asking why you have a deep? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so this have is double a, peaks. Yeah, this is very has very easy explanation. I mean, the deep in the middle for the PP is due for uh, the Jacobian transformation from the, the rapidity to the transfer to the pseudo rapidity. There is a Jacobian, which driven by the particles, mostly it has an effect. There is also a little deep here. Look, for example, kappa kappa. You see it? Yes. yes. And there is a little deep, but mostly within the systematic. It's relative. If you look to the gray band, it's flat. But this is just due the transformation from rapidity to transfer to the pseudo rapidity, which I will show the formula. There is a Jacobian there. But which is interesting here, look to this guy here. This is a deuteron goal. It's yes. not symmetry, yeah? Yes. This is PP, this is PP. The right side and the left side are exactly the same, all this, except the day goal. It's not symmetry. Why is it? It's because because the big old you have a small nucleus with a big nucleus. But what's happened? The peak. This is the gold peak. Okay. And this is and this is the dirt uh -huh. So that's we have more is. particles. For us. This is what you call. Yeah. This is what you call asymmetric system. All right. Um. I will there are other questions. Um, 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 Mohammed, that was uh, thanks for uh, such a comprehensive list of questions. That's very nice. Um, so, uh, uh, Kola, you want to ask your question? Are you still around? Yeah. Uh, so, I think it's in. Let me just check quickly. The slide with the um, uh, list of uh, where it's 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's the slide with the different species that have been collided at the RIC experiment. I just wanted to find out like what, 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 what informs the choice in uh, species that are used to collide in the experiment, at the RIC experiment. Yeah. And that also, also I noticed that for uranium, uranium <coughs> ion collisions, you had a relatively high, a relatively high um, luminosity that was delivered. But then it was only done once in 2012. I was also wanting to find out why it was only done once, um, as opposed uh, the to the answer is very easy. Yeah, thank you very much. I think this is a very good question. Why we are the why we are colliding different species? I mean, from gold, gold to urana, uranium to the sea gold, and if you look very carefully here, proton, aluminium, huh? helium, gold copper, gold, all different species. The reason is very simple. You just want to see is what you observe in gold gold. Do you see it when you change the system? Depend is this is depend on the system size because every time you collide different system, you create different configuration, different geometry of the system. You see what I mean? Yeah. Is, is QGP depend on the species of the system size? I mean, all of them, they are made from protons. Doesn't matter. You take gold, gold, or PT or stuff. I mean, they have gold, protons and gold uh, and neutrons. But the number of the protons change. You just want to see, is the QGP medium depend on the system size, uh, like uh, the first is, thing we can do is gold gold, which is higher, copper copper, which is in medium size. And PP is always our baseline. We always compare to the PP at the same energy. If you see very carefully here, every time you have gold gold or other species, 200 GB, you need to have proton proton 200 GB. If you have, for example, copper copper 62 GB, you need to have PP at 62 GB. Otherwise, we don't have a baseline. We don't really can compare. Okay, and you see here the strong gold stuff. This is, I, I believe, I answer to really why we are having different system size size between species. And you ask question why we did uranium once and that's it. Why we didn't do it different times and different? What, what, the reason why is very simple. When we did uranium, uranium, we found that the measurement is exactly the same as a gold gold. There is no difference. Mm. And also, the uranium uranium is very complex system because the uranium, uh, if you know a little bit nuclear structure, is before the uranium is has like a rugby ball, you know, you know the rugby ball, something like that, it has elongated, but the gold, the gold nucleus, uh, nucleus is a spherical shape. I mean, when you collide two spherical shapes, it's much easier to understand than you come to, than when you, uh, you hit two rigid balls, because one of them can be head on, and the other one is not a head on, is perpendicular. A different chain oh, yeah, yeah, is more yeah. complex. The first one is the, the choice of the, the deformation of the nucleus. And it's not even possible it's to order. Control it to determination in uranium. uranium Huh? Oh, sorry. I was just asking if it's, it's not it's not possible to orientate the the ions in a specific way. <clears throat> Maybe that would be a, no. a waste of time. No, no. I mean, when 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 you put when you put them in the bunch, the, the bunch, the, the the packets, they can be a different orientation. You know, and uh, you you see that if you have them uh, not like head on, that head on or something, the number of the particles change. And the physics obtained by uranium is relatively, like nuclear modification after another state, is relatively compared to gold gold. This is why uh, people run very quickly back to gold gold and they said, okay, I hope I answered your question if you have it, something more. Yeah, oh, it's just uh, one more question I wanted to ask. Oh. So in, 
in a, uh, a previous con conference that I was in, where you know, it's this experiment, a similar experiment in Germany where they were colliding two gold, two gold ions in that experiment. They said that they were looking for black holes in that experiment, right? And I know that I know that like your your your, your yeah. research is dictated by what you are actually looking for in the experiment. But then what I wanted to find out was if yeah. there were to be like new new physics that physics that's not that's not part of what you're trying to look for in your experiments, would that would that uh, distort your results in, in any way, even if you're not looking for black holes, for instance. Yeah, I mean, let me tell you, I mean, when the RIC project started in the beginning, I remember when I was a postdoc, there was a lot of strikes in the front of the laboratory, lots of people striking. They said, if you start this machine, you will create a black hole, and the whole thing will go into the black hole detector people the whole thing there was a lot of nightmare about this and for many for many weeks people are afraid that heavy ion collision will create black hole. however we did the collision and it didn't happen black hole we still alive you know We're still here i know i mean the question is do we see the black holes in our experiments and we do stuff i mean we don't have a group of researchers to have them uh, work in a black hole at in given experiments. But I know to create black hole, you need a lot of energy, very high energy. This is why the best place to study the black holes is Alash C. And I think there is a lot of groups over there. They are trying to study the black holes and given experiments. And some of them, they are talking about some kind of uh, measurements and some signature and stuff like that. But I'm not really involved on this. I mean, in heavy ion collision, mostly we never talk about uh, uh, black holes and creation and missing particles. However, I mean, all the particles created, we observe them and we detect them. There is nothing that's missing, as far as I know. Maybe Kitabi can talk about the, some measurements in black holes at, uh, or another person expert in black holes at Alashi. Any yeah. comments, Kitabi, about black holes? Yeah, I mean, we know that. Uh, sorry, I, I was muted. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, um, you know, the, at the PP collision, there is the possibility or probability of creating, uh, you know, mini, what they call mini uh, uh, black holes, but they don't live for very long. They, they decay very quickly through what we call Hawkins. Hawkins radiation or something like that. So it's uh, it's not something of, of really of, of, of a concern. So uh, um, yeah, I, I I have not myself studied it uh, directly because the at the LHC there are many many studies uh, going on in, in parallel. I know some people have tried to search for that, uh, but I have not really seen a, an evidence of. Uh, of, of, of that uh, being, you know, completely uh, demonstrated that, uh, that it has been seen. But nevertheless, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's understood theoretically that uh, if such a black hole is created, it's what is called a mini black hole and, and, and it doesn't live for very long, it then, then it decays uh, back very quickly now, so. Um, now in the high energy physics, uh, I mean, in the heavy ion experiment, I think, I don't know, what would be the probability of creating a mini black hole like that? I, I don't know. I have not uh, thought about it. Okay. I mean, you need a lot of energy to create black hole. That's right, yeah. <laughs> only place I, yes. Yeah, I mean, the only place, the only place I really, I, I believe to black hole Okay, so let's see. I, I think it's astrophysic in space. Yeah. In space, there is black holes. There you see that. Um, okay, I think there was another question on the chat. Um, let me see. Uh, Yasin, 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 are you here?
Please go ahead, Yasin. You want to state your question or should I read it? All right, so Yasin said I should read her his question. What makes RIG yes. accelerator special with respect to the LHC? Um, that is, if there is a new particle at the LHC, would, would, it, would the RIG see it? Uh, would it be because it reaches higher energy compared to the RIG 10 times? If there is a new particle? Sir. If there is a new particle, the LHC will see it because it reaches higher energy compared to the weak. So the question is, again, yeah, it's the same question. What makes the weak accelerator special with respect to the LHC? Because basically, if there's a new particle, LHC will see it. Therefore, what is the importance of uh, justification to still have the weak? Which was the question that Mohammed was asking earlier. Yeah. I think we have to underline something very clearly. I mean, LHC is a high energy, high energy physics. Uh, they are doing that, and they looking. I mean, they have already sent. Uh, this means they are looking for something different regime as LHC. Uh, this is what we have: uh, CMS and Atlas and uh, LHCb. At RIC, we don't do high energy physics for like. I see. We are mostly a trick. We focus, study, PCB matter. We are looking for medium. We are looking for to understand the structure, the structure of the uh, the, 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 the nucleus, like for in and all this kind of stuff. It's slightly different physics. We never, we will never absorb the Higgs boson as I say, because the physics regime is completely different, and also we are not doing is a uh, mostly characters of high energy physics. If you found the new Particle at, which is required high energy, you will never see it at risk. You see what I mean? But for QCD matter, QCD matter, the property of quark muon plasma, Alice at LHC can compare his results to the results from the RIC at different energies. These two facilities are complementary, but the physics is slightly more. LHC has high energy physics to look for new particles. You never heard, I think, the Higgs boson that's it, but you will heard about it. We heard about it at LHC. Do you see what the difference between the two? Let me look for the, the shots. Ah. Okay. Well, so he said, Rashid, he said that, uh, thank you. So he, he understood yeah. your explanation. Yeah. Somebody, uh, I think uh, they were also asking for your email address, but your email address is already on the, on the agenda, uh, on the Indigo agenda page. Uh, I have your email address there. Um, oh no, I didn't, and have, also it. I didn't have it. I didn't have it. I will put it Oh wait. Yeah, it is there on the agenda page. Mm -hmm. For the people who are asking. So if you want to, here's the agenda. Yeah. Um, and also in the studio. Yeah, and you can see in, in his resume there. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we, um, this, uh, the discussion was quite nice. We went even 30 minutes beyond. So um, I propose that we stop here. Um, Dr. Rashid will give uh, the second part of his lecture next week. And uh, so uh, we can have the opportunity to have uh, more discussion at that time. So I would like to thank everybody now for participating and uh, let's, uh, let's uh, get back uh, next week and discuss more about the uh, relativistic to the ion physics. Uh, okay, thanks everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye.